Good morning, and welcome to UCC Longmont this morning. I am Amelia Richardson Dress. My pronouns are she, hers. I'm the senior pastor here at UCC Longmont, and it is a joy to be with you all this morning, as it always is. This is a community of hope that is grounded in the practices that we experience here and moves out in service to the world. And so in our time here, I hope that you will open your hearts and your minds and your spirits to new ways that God might be moving in you and among you and within you. Today's service is an intergenerational service. It had been planned to be Children's Church. You may have seen that in Happenings, and we are making a switch this morning. Um, As always, though, in our services, kids are welcome here in the sanctuary. This is a place for people of all ages and all abilities. There is a coloring table in the back there. If you are a person of any age who uh, thinks and prays better when your hands are busy, you can be back there. There is a staffed nursery. Nicole is back there this morning, and that is available as well. Um, And if during the service you're uh, needing to see a little better or hear a little better, feel free to move around and be in a place that makes that possible for you. Movement is uh, welcome if that's what is needed. It's our practice on Sunday mornings to greet one another using the words that are printed in our bulletin, and so I invite you to maybe take a look around and see who is here with you if you are in the sanctuary. And if you're joining us online, you might imagine the people that are joining with you from other places online or here in the sanctuary as we say to one another, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. One of the ways that we can practice hope in our lives is to notice abundance. And so in this moment as we pause, before we move forward into other elements of the service, take a minute and let your heart be drawn to something that you have plenty of. What do you have a lot of in your life? And you might even close your eyes or just let your gaze be down toward the floor. And let's settle in that experience of enough, of much, of more than enough. We know that God is a God of plenty. And we know that God calls and equips each of us as God's beloveds to walk in that way of abundance. May that be the spirit that you take with you through the service and the rest of the week. We are going to rise as it's comfortably able for you in body or in spirit to sing, Arise, Your Light Has Come and the children will be bringing in the light. And I forgot one, it's good I looked at my bullets and I forgot one little thing I wanted to say. Um, We have a couple little name things for the bulletin. Dave Ostick will be doing our gathering words this morning. And Peter Linder is here with us on uh, cello, although I'm sure Peter Zinder is fantastic as well. Let us rise and sing as bring in the light.
Good morning. We gather together to worship the God of our fathers and mothers, the God of Abraham and Sarah, of Miriam and Moses. Who invites us to put aside self-interest, take up our cross, and discover what it means to be to truly live. Let's worship together. Matthew 16, 21 through 25. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life, will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Raise your hand if your life has gone according to plan. Usually when nobody's hands go up, it's when I have to reassure you that I'm not going to call on you, but I suspect that nobody's hands went up on purpose this morning. <laughs> Few to none of us have had that experience where our lives have gone according to plan because life is full of surprises, which is one of those things that we know even if we don't like it. And another way that we can think about that is thinking about the shape of a story. Every good story is made up of a crisis point. It has that moment when things shift from something relatively normal to something else. One of the frameworks of understanding this shift, which many of you are probably familiar with, is the idea of a hero's journey. Right? Joseph Campbell popularized this in the mid-1900s um, as he looked at, at a lot of research that other people were doing and applied kind of some literary analysis to social analysis. And his theory was that there was a structure in the way that the great myths were told and that in understanding these stories, it could help us understand our own lives. And so the summary of, of that that he called the hero's journey is that a person is living something like an ordinary normal life. And then something happens and they are sent out into the world. And it's there that they encounter new things, maybe supernatural forces that they have to either fight or outwit. And then they come back and they live in their lives as a new person with new gifts. You can think of stories that follow that general structure. If we mapped that story, it might kind of look like there's a normal place that's flat, and then things kind of dip at that crisis point, and maybe right down at the bottom, or kind of as things are about as bad as it looks like they could be, <laughs> there's a victory. They win, and things get better and go back to new life, and new life is, is kind of better than it was. That's the payoff of going through this story. It's one way of understanding the shape of our lives. Another way of understanding the shape of our lives is that there's this upward trajectory. And in this framework, you start somewhere, 
and you work hard and things improve. So you're a baby, but you learn to walk and to talk and you study hard and you graduate, right? Things are going up. Or you're born into poverty, but you work hard and you save money and you become a billionaire. That's that kind of upward line from the beginning to the made it which reminds us that we can also tell our story in the reverse. We can tell our story as a downward trajectory. Right? Things were good, and they got steadily worse, and now they are terrible, and they are going to continue getting terrible. Right? Some people have that quote, life's hard and then you die. <laughs> That's this downward trajectory. My husband, the other day, I asked him how work was, and he said, the horrors persist, but so do I. <laughs> so that's maybe another take on that. <laughs> Thinking about those frameworks is important because how we tell our story matters. Right? The stories are never just about looking back. It also shapes how we look forward. Some of you know that before I came to UCC Longmont, my focus was interim and renewal ministries. And in that setting, one of the crucial tasks that happens in a transition time period for the church is telling the story. Who are we? How did we get here? And for me, when we do that work, it wasn't primarily about events, which are important, but what I was listening for was the shape of the story. And that shows up in other ways, too. One of the factors in a kid's ability to cope with life's difficulties is how well they know their family stories. But there's a particular shape to it. In particular, it matters for kids' resilience that they know that there were ups and downs in the lives of their parents and grandparents. We've been through hard times, and we made it. That's the storyline that makes a difference. That's what's motivating in the first two frameworks that we looked at, right? That third one doesn't have a lot of motivation in it. But in the first two, those frameworks remind us to take a long view if we are in a difficult time. Whatever dragons it is that we are facing, whether it is a hard stage of parenting or a job loss or a new school or a health diagnosis, we can take the perspective that this isn't forever. It might be hard, but it might get better. The downside, though, to that hero narrative and that upward trajectory, the things that I kind of lump them together as the victory narratives, is that there is a happily ever after. Right? There is a point in the distance that we are striving for, and once we get there, everything will be okay. If you've ever hit a milestone in your life and had a great celebration and then woken up the next day and wondered, oh, well, what's next? Then you know one reason why this story can fall apart. We always tend to be looking for the next thing. But it also falls apart because it doesn't account for the fact that life isn't linear. It's not only not linear, but it is less linear now than it ever was. So if we took a career path, for example, there is this expectation, or was this expectation, that you would start somewhere, and it would maybe advance nicely forward, maybe even upward, right? We talk about the corporate ladder. And even if you're not in a corporate setting, that thinking pervades. But if we stick with that example and we add in the fact that new technologies are routinely developed and that a skill that you spent years learning might become outdated and unneeded tomorrow, then your career path starts to look a lot different. It starts to get trickier to map. And so maybe it looks like kind of lines that are all over the place and they might circle back to a starting point and they might maybe go up again, right? Does anybody's career path look a little bit like that in some way? 
And that's just one example, right? We could say the same thing about any stage of life, from elementary school to retirement. And we could also add in other things that are going on at the same time. Maybe you're trying to buy a house, and so your house savings trajectory is doing all of that, and you're maybe wanting some romance in your life, and your romance line is doing all of those things too, and you can imagine the shape that you end up with. It's hard to put it in one of those first lines, right? Not only does life start getting harder to map, but it means we spend more time in transition. Transition isn't just something that we move through. It's a place that we come back to again and again and again. And so I want to pause for a moment. And in your bulletin, I think there's some space kind of in the middle. Let's just take a few moments. And if you have a pencil handy, there's often some in the pews. Maybe you have a pen that you brought with you. Draw the shape of your life. It's not a test. It can look however you want it to look. What kinds of shapes do people end up with? (laughs) A sawtooth. (laughs) Other sawtooth. Say that again. (laughs) Paisley. Paisley. (laughs) Any roller coasters? (laughs) Some roller coasters. Yeah. One of the things that sometimes can come up is as you're doing the sawtooth life design or maybe the roller coaster life design, there's some loops, right, for the highs and the lows. And sometimes you might find that your loops kind of come back off, but they lead back to the center like a little flower. Sometimes you might find an end point that feels like the end point that's right for you right now, even if you know that there's maybe some more roller coaster to go. Sometimes you find that you change your focus completely along somewhere in that line. There's a story that goes like that about a person that I'm going to call Frank this morning. Frank grew up in a fundamentalist Christian household, and he was taught and believed that if you were a good Christian, then good things would happen to you. And so when he experienced a cancer diagnosis in his teenage years, he prayed harder, and he did better, and he improved. And then he got married, and he had kids, and his family was in a tragic accident, and it took them a while to heal, and it was in that time when healing was maybe that sawtooth or maybe that roller coaster that he started questioning the way that he had been living. He had a crisis of faith, is the more accurate way of saying that. And first he tried praying harder and going to church more because that was the thing that he knew worked. But the more that he did it, the more that the things that he thought he knew didn't make sense. And God ended up feeling very far away. And at some point in uh, what we call a long dark night of the soul, he had an epiphany. And it was an epiphany that would have felt terrifying to him years ago, but in that moment it was liberating. He realized that he was not being punished. 
And the reason that that could have felt terrifying is that it meant that there was no guaranteed way out. Life might not ever get perfect. What was liberating for him was that it opened a new relationship with God. It opened a new relationship with God that sustained him later on when he got laid off and later on when his kids left the house and he wasn't quite sure what to do and later on when he went into retirement and found that that was a change for him. That kind of story doesn't fit well on one of our neat timelines. We can map a little bit Frank's life on a measure of health or of finances or of career success, and they're all going to look pretty messy. But he describes those times as a period of being rescued. And that's a description that only fits if we change the entire orientation of our lives. That's what Jesus is suggesting in the scripture that we heard In that scripture, they're journeying along and um, Peter and Jesus have a conversation, right? And Peter is saying, you can't die. And Jesus is saying, you have to take up your cross. If we could ask Peter what the shape of his life is, I think that he would see it as that hero narrative, right? They're in a tough spot now, but everything is going to shift soon. And so Jesus' comment that he is going to die is difficult to comprehend in that viewpoint. That is not the way a hero ends. And Peter responds, God forbid, that may never happen. The hero should go on and live happily forever after, right? And all the people who are along with him also go on and live happily ever after. But put up against that viewpoint, put up against that way of looking at life, of measuring success and failure, ups and downs, Jesus turns it all around. He doesn't even at that moment reassure them that they are going to go on and do great things or that his death will be a temporary setback. He shifts the way of measuring. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. There's no upward trajectory here, at least not in the way we typically think of it. Following Jesus isn't a point on the lines of our lives. It's not like a way stop on one of our roller coasters to success. Following Jesus is the way entirely. And so we could describe it as being a cross-shaped life, where what we measure is how well we are serving others. That's true for us as individuals, but it is also true for us as a church. Right? Organizations and even entire societies tell themselves the stories the same way that we talked about our individual stories. We draw timelines, right? They're like this. And we measure history maybe according to ups and downs. We might even argue what those ups and downs were, but we're clear that there were ups and downs. And so we look at the stock market and at inflation and at the GDP to measure times of success. And we vote along those lines, right? Are they promising improvement? And that might be an appropriate way to look at government, but it is not the way that Jesus tells us to look at who we are as Christians. It is not the measure of our personal lives. And it's not the measure of a church. That's because our measure of worth, our measure of success isn't based on our budget or our programs, or any of the other things that we find ourselves looking at when we're trying to figure out who we are. Our measure is how well we serve others. Our measure is love. And I hope that that sounds freeing to you. 
because it is a way of life that offers liberation. Right? It's a way of life that is anchored in real hope, the kind of hope that comes from knowing who we are, the kind of hope from knowing that we have the ability to be part of God's unfolding story. That's the power of a cross-shaped life. And so my prayer and my vision for us is that we ask ourselves today and every day, who did I love? Who did I love? Because it's in that answer that we find our true purpose and our ability to live into true hope.
music itself was a prayer. And so as we continue into that spirit of prayer, let's return to the experience of abundance that we noticed this morning. Let you have a moment to revisit that. Let your body notice again what that sensation of abundance felt like. from a place of blessing and belovedness. Let us pray. God who gives all things, who creates us, who names us beloved ones, who calls and equips us, Thank you for the many ways that we see your presence. And here in this space, we say out loud or hold in our hearts the things we are grateful for today. God of abundance, who is present to us even when life is not going according to plan. I ask that you send your spirit down on those who need it the most today. And so we hold in our hearts or say out loud, those who are in need of healing in mind, body, or spirit. God of many things. For the times when we have failed to notice the gifts that you give, we ask your forgiveness and we trust that you are opening our eyes in a new way each day. And so we pray together this morning using the words of a prayer that Jesus once taught. Our loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the dominion, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so continuing in the spirit of prayer, let us rise in spirit and sing together uh, from from the New Century Hymnal number 312.
everyone. My name is Debbie Mavis, and my pronouns are she, hers. I serve on the church council, and it's good to be together this morning. A very special welcome this morning to our visitors and guests, and welcome back to those who haven't been here for a while. We're so glad you're here. Youth, registration for the youth retreat at La Forret, La Forret is open. Please see the youth, youth newsletter for more information. Randy Porter is going as a leader, so there will be a familiar face. As a creation justice church, we can learn more about justice in our country by joining together as a group and traveling to Montgomery, Alabama. Brian Stevenson is the leader of the Equal Justice Initiative and the director of the Legacy Museum in Montgomery. Judith Miller is inviting you to join her in Montgomery to tour the Legacy Museum, which is about the history of slavery in this country, and, the tour, and tour other historical civil rights areas. We will meet with one another, um, UCC group from Montgomery, and share stories. This trip will be sometime in April. Please see Judith Miller, leader of this trip, if you're interested in going. Uh, Judy, can you stand up, wave? Yay. OK, thank you so much. Um, joining, uh, join us this Thursday, August 29th, from 9.30 to 11 in room 10 uh, for a volunteer opportunity at Born to Read. Be a part of the Born to Read program and make a difference in children's lives through literacy. Your time and passion can help nurture young minds. Plan to stick around next week after church for a chance to experience Connection Circle. This short guided conversation is a great way to get to know each other better. If you've enjoyed the opportunities for one-on-one -on -one conversation and worship recently, you'll enjoy this too. Um, join us this Sunday after worship for a special discernment workshop. You can also find other announcements in Happenings and in the bulletin to keep you connected. If you would like to support UCC uh, Longmont financially, you can give online at ucclongmont.org forward slash giving or using the offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary. Um, we are grateful for your generosity. Thank you all and have a great week. One more thing, uh, we are in the middle, or not in the middle, we are making progress and doing a great work on our search and call process for another pastor um, in a minister for community faith formation role. If you were not able to be here last week, uh, please get one of these demographic surveys and fill it out. There's space, there are two kind of bistro tables in the back there for you to set them on. These are just part of our profile. And, and in the UCC, a profile is like a very big job description when you are getting ready to call somebody else to serve alongside of you. Uh, it's really helpful information that goes on there just for candidates to get a little bit of a feel for who we are. There's um, space to fill them out one per family so one person can just kind of fill that in there if you have a household of more than one family and we really appreciate you taking the time to do that our next hymn i left my bulletin back at where i am sitting but i trust you all have it let us rise in spirit and prepare to bless one another in song
Friends, as you go out into the world, go out to live cross-shaped lives. Go out knowing that whatever path your life might be taking, whatever way you might draw it in that moment, there are opportunities to ask the most important question, who can I love? And as you do this, know that the light of God surrounds you. The love of God enfolds you. The power of God protects you. The presence of God watches over you. And wherever you are, God is. Go in peace.
Are you with you? Yes. Only had to fake a couple bars. Those are beautiful. I need to perform more. I don't. It's just different, right? 